Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Pit Nass. If you would, go ahead and please stand, and we will enter into a time of worship. you've done for me and worthy is the lamb slain worthy is the king who conquered the grave worthy is the lamb who was slain worthy is the king who conquered the grave the Lamb who was slain, worthy is the King who conquered the grave.
of kindness you have poured out grace you brought me out of darkness you have filled me with peace give her mercy or oh my help in time of me lord i can't help but sing Savior, beautiful Savior, you have brought me near. You pulled me from the ashes, you have broken every curse. Blessed Redeemer, you have kept this captive free. Lord, I can't help.
promises are yes and amen And I will rest In your promises My confidence your faithfulness and I will rest in your promises my confidence is your faithfulness Heavenly Father thank you Thank you that all your promises are yes and amen. Thank you that you are the God that we can turn to when times are tough, when times are hard, when things don't seem to be going the way that we think they should go. God, you are good and you love us so much. I pray that during this time today in this service, God, that we would just surrender our hearts to you, that we would surrender our thoughts and our minds to you, God that everything we do would glorify you today because that is what we're here to do today. God, I pray for Kyle. I pray for the words that he, that he is about to speak, that I pray that they would be from you, that you would speak through him and that you would touch our hearts. God, we love you and we serve you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. God is good. Amen. Good morning. Welcome home. We are glad you're here today. If you're in Columbus this morning or you're here in Pittsburgh, welcome home. Um, we just sang a song here in the Pittsburgh location that talks about the faithfulness of God. And so this morning, I just maybe sense the spirit of God today before we get into anything Let's just close our eyes today, this morning here in Pittsburgh and in Columbus, if you want to do it online as well, and just tell God how he's been faithful to you. I just want to sense the spirit today uh, and, and begin there. Just tell God real quick, both locations this morning, how has God been faithful to you? Before we hear his word, can we just tell him how he's been faithful? Just take a second. God, you are so faithful to us. Father, we love you. God, just hear, hear our heart, Lord, and how you have been faithful to us. We sense your spirit today, and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen. Amen. Well, God has been faithful, amen. And if you were here last Sunday night from Columbus or if you were from Pittsburgh, we were all gathered together here last Sunday night and God just showed up in an amazing way. And we just want to celebrate uh, just people leaning in and pressing in and finding some answers and hearing God's voice. And so we're hoping that that would happen again today, that God would allow us just to press in to what he has for us today. We're in this series called Distractions. And we've been talking about how God calls us to not live distracted, but to be intentional. In fact, most of the things that are accomplished in life, whether they're spiritual or otherwise, they usually, not always, but usually they happen intentionally. They don't typically happen naturally. And we are normally and naturally distracted, and so we want to avoid that. The word distract means to prevent from giving our full attention to something. One of Satan's biggest strategies that he uses, this is kind of an awareness, you know, to raise an awareness series. One of the strategies that Satan uses more than anything else is just to distract us. And so I have a question today as we get into this this morning. Um, have you ever felt like there is more going on than meets the eye? You know, it's your grandchild or your child or someone who comes up to you and they're being nice and maybe they're not normally nice or at least they're not normally that nice, right? And, and, and you almost, whether you say it out loud or not, you're like, okay, what do you want? 
right? Why would you think I want anything, you know? And you quickly realize they do have an ulterior motive. Does it seem that no matter how hard you try, someone or something keeps distracting you from what God is calling you to do? Many of you know, maybe some of you don't, that I drive a school bus for USD 250. And every year, uh, the route changes just a little bit because there's new kids on the bus. And, and so on one of my routes, there's a, a new stop. And so I've just, just I'm like, I'm not going to miss this stop. I'm not going to forget this stop. And the first few days, I didn't miss the stop. And then there was this other kid, I won't say his name, who wouldn't sit down on the bus, Right. So at first I said, you know, will you sit down and can you sit down? And he wouldn't sit down. And so I'm saying sit down. And I started gazing at the back and kind of glancing in front of me. And I missed a stop because I was focused and distracted by someone who wasn't paying attention. I didn't miss it by a lot. So I was able to just stop the bus and the kid that I, you know, their stop was able to get off. But I got to thinking about that illustration because sometimes God has something for us. And whether it's a, someone we care about or someone that's being an egghead like this kid was or whatever in our life, we can get distracted and miss the moment. I mean, did you realize there's times where maybe you're on your phone and your child said something really important to you and you missed it because you were distracted by the latest video that someone posted? We can all do that, right? So sometimes there's more going on than we even realize. In fact, what if your distraction is spiritual in nature? And that's what we're going to be talking about today, spiritual distractions. Say that with me, spiritual distractions. Did you know that sometimes the argument that you got into it with your child or your husband or someone on the way to church, that it might be a little bit more spiritual than you realize? It might be that the enemy is trying to distract you from hearing what he has for you, and he wants you to be focused on being frustrated with your spouse who you were talking to or your child that you had a disagreement with on the way to church. Have you ever thought of that before? Have you ever thought sometimes that the enemy can distract you from the bigger picture by something that doesn't really matter? It's called spiritual distractions. You see, God's plan includes physical actions. He wants us to do things and say things and go places and hear things and respond to what he wants us to respond to. But the enemy's plan is to distract us from that. And that's called a spiritual distraction. So here's where we're going today. God has plans that include physical action. And the enemy's plans will always include spiritual distractions. Now, I'm not trying to over-spiritualize everything that happens to us in our life. But sometimes the reality is that there are situations that take place. And if we aren't connected with God and walking with God, we'll pass it off as something other than what it really is. See, the Bible, this is kind of a different kind of a a, a message today. The Bible talks about that there's the seen world, what we see, and there's the unseen world. Like take, for example, when you are in a restaurant and your waiter or waitress is hateful with you. Now, what you see is bad, bad customer service. But what you may not see is that her husband left her two hours before her shift started. Or her child's really sick, and she's really worried about if they're going to be okay. Now, we can all wrap our brain around that analogy. And in that same frame of mind, there are times where when we take something at face value, we're only seeing the the physical or seen world, and really there's more going on there. So how do we see what we physically can't see? How do we not get distracted by the things the enemy throws at us and are able to to be focused on what God wants for us, okay? Many of us maybe have heard the story of Nehemiah. Maybe some of us haven't. But Nehemiah was this cupbearer, okay? We don't have too many cupbearers in today's culture. But Nehemiah was a cupbearer to the king. 
And what had taken place in Nehemiah's life is many of the people had been exiled the same way when Hurricane Katrina hit. A lot of people were exiled from New Orleans to Houston, if some of us remember that, and they were living in another land. Many people were exiled into another land, and Nehemiah is also exiled to this other place. And he begins to hear about these walls in Jerusalem that have been destroyed. See, back then, a wall was a city's protection, and a wall was a security net or a safety net. It's like your front door to your house. Imagine if you had the same house, but you didn't have a front door. Would you feel a little vulnerable? Of course. And walls were like that back then for cities. And Nehemiah hears that they're in ruins, that these walls are in ruins. And God puts a burden on his, on his heart to replace these walls. So he goes to the king, and a lot of things happen. And long story short, he's able to go back and begin to examine these walls and start to work on these walls. And while he's doing this, there is constant spiritual distractions taking place. There is an ongoing opposition taking place to the rebuilding of these walls. In fact, Scripture talks a lot about it in Nehemiah 6. So there's these two guys, I'll butcher their names if I say them, but they're there on the screen. So these two guys basically are kind of the the leaders of trying to distract Nehemiah from what God's called him to do. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like someone or something is distracting you from what God has for you? Maybe it's, it's from a good person. Like maybe you're wanting to spend time with God and your child won't, won't sit still for a little bit so you can. Maybe you're trying to spend time with God and someone keeps texting you. Maybe you're trying to do exactly what God's called you to do and situations keep coming up to where you can't or it seems like you can't. That's what these two guys were doing. So these two guys, they send Nehemiah a message while he's working on this wall, doing what God wants him to do. And they say, hey, let's meet in the village, you know, one of the villages in the plain of Anno. And so as he gets this message while he's working on the wall, it would be really easy for him to say, oh, okay, I guess I'll come down off the wall and go and meet with these guys. But his spiritual antenna is up because he's been spending time with God. See, I'm hoping today that this message wouldn't just challenge us, but it would change us. It would bring us to this place where we would start to seek that our antenna would be up through time with God. So Nehemiah's put his time in with God. He's been walking closely with God. And God gives him discernment. You know, that ability to decide what's right and what's wrong, because sometimes it's hard to. Should I take the job or should I not? Should we, should I go to them or should I give them some space? Give me some discernment, God. And in that moment, God gives discernment to Nehemiah when they ask him to get off the wall. And he realizes, you know, oh, that light comes on in his head and he realizes they're plotting to harm me. They don't want to meet. See, the enemy throws a spiritual distraction at Nehemiah, but he catches it. So Nehemiah says, I sent this message to him. And we'll read about that in just a second. (laughs) So before we go any farther, as we look at that, where he says, but I realized they were plotting to harm me, so I I replied by sending this message. Here's what we can grab from that before we move on. Spiritual discernment reveals spiritual distractions. Spiritual discernment reveals spiritual distractions. Now, don't be distracted by this being something that's kind of hard to understand or, or be distracted by it's hard for you to understand where we're going with this. Press in just a little bit, okay? As we walk with God, he gives us wisdom. He allows us to have wisdom and discernment to be able to determine what is a distraction 
And what is something that we actually do need to take action on? Just the other day, I just spent some time with God. And a few hours later, something came up where someone was wanting me to respond right now. And I just felt this whisper say to me, it can wait. It can wait till Monday. It doesn't have to be right now. Now, earlier on in the week, I had responded when I shouldn't have. My point with that is, is as we walk with God, he heightens that into our lives. So Nehemiah says, but I realized they were plotting to harm me. I realized they were plotting to harm me, so I replied by sending this message. I am engaged in a great work, so I can't come. Why should I stop working to come and meet with you? <clears throat> Can I just tell you today, some of us need to say no to some things. So we can say yes to the right things. Some of us need to keep doing what God's called us to do. And stop worrying about every little thing that people think. See, there's a real temptation sometimes to come off the wall because people, people think you should. People think sometimes that, that, that you need to take on their stuff. See, you can't please the one who created you if you're distracted by all the views of the people around you. Really what this series is about is idolatry. Allowing other people and places and things and expectations, even sometimes good people, I don't know, it was like a year ago or two years ago, someone had died and I needed to go and meet with the family. And my son said something like, you know, you're always leaving. And I'm working on that. But in that moment, I gently rebuked that and said, <clears throat> there are times where I have to go. I'm going to give you your time back, but I have to go right now. What I was saying was, you're not going to hand me that one. I'll take some of the other ones, but I'm not taking that one. Who's distracting you from what God has called you to do? Who's keeping you from going all in for God? Four times they send this message to Nehemiah. Four different times they basically want to meet with him. They want him to stop working, stop doing what God's called him to do because they're trying to sabotage it. In fact, the fifth time these guys come together, and this time they have an open letter. They're using fear as a tactic to get them distracted. Did you know that the enemy's almost number one thing that he will do to try to get you distracted is fear? They have an open letter in his hand. And, and let me just tell you, Nehemiah, here's the letter. It's official. It's on city, city paper. There's a rumor going around, around the surrounding nations. And Geshem, and he tells me that it's true that you and the Jews are planning to rebel. And that is why you are building this wall. There's a rumor going around. If we can't get you to come down with subtlety, we'll try to make it official. There's this rumor going around. People are talking. People are saying stuff. So maybe you need to quit working for God. Maybe you need to do this. Maybe you need to do that. And man, there would be some pressure there. There would be some huge pressure for us. We would have to be walking with God to be able to see that one because it's like the enemy has turned up the heat on the distraction. But Nehemiah is grounded in God.
And as they go on, according to his reports, you plan to be their king. He also reports that you've appointed prophets in Jerusalem to proclaim about you. Look, there is the king of Judah. So he's basically saying the reason you're building this wall is because you want to be king. You're trying to rebel and all this different stuff. You can be very sure that this report will get back to the king. So I suggest that you come and talk it over with me. See, fear wants to talk about it. Faith is focused on what God said about it. Fear wants to talk about it, and faith is focused on what God puts in our hearts about it and what God said about it. Well, let's just talk about it. Let's just talk about what, what, what you're already started doing. Let's just talk about it. There are times where we need to talk about it. When we planted the church in Columbus, we spent time praying about that. We spent time fasting over that. We spent time, try, time trying to figure out what God wanted. We had w- one couple in our church that lived in Columbus. And there was an appropriate amount of time where we needed to pray about it and get discernment about it and talk about it. For those of you in in Columbus who maybe are new to the church, I went on sabbatical last year and many many of you joined me in praying about what God had for our church. And I talked with God about the fears, as many of you may have. I talked with God about it doesn't make sense on paper. The math doesn't make sense. I mean, you're supposed to launch a a church, right, with a certain amount of people from that area. Um, This doesn't make sense. And God revealed himself to me, and he revealed himself to us. And there was a time where it was time to start, stop talking about it, and it was time to start doing something about it. Amen? See, there's a time to talk, to talk about stuff, and there's a time where the talking is over, and it's time to get to work. If God has been calling you for a long period of time or however long, and you know what he's asking you to do, and you keep sitting there thinking about it and talking it over with everybody on the phone and everyone around you and analyzing all of that, God might be telling you to stop talking about it and do something about it. Nehemiah had already settled the question in his heart. He had already decided that God had told him he was supposed to build the wall. Not only had he decided, he was working on it. And we can just know right now, raising awareness, okay, that just because God has said something to you doesn't mean that the devil's not going to try to test you doesn't mean that he's not going to come after you. It doesn't mean that everyone's going to understand what you're called to. I bet there was a lot of people that thought David was an idiot and crazy for going up against Goliath, who was nine foot nine and weighed 500 pounds, and David was 12 years old and weighed five foot nothing, 100 nothing. Sounds crazy. But David wasn't distracted. Nehemiah wasn't distracted. And church, we got to quit being distracted. Your husband doesn't want you to go to church all the time because he's not a believer. Who's first, you or your husband? Your kids don't really feel like going to church and you don't want to disappoint them. So you're distracted by trying to please them and so they don't come. Who are you putting first, God or the kids? And there's times in our life where we can't ride the coattails of someone else's faith, where we can't avoid the messy, where we can't avoid the difficult. There are times where we have to prove that we are a follower of Jesus. If you love me, you will obey my commands. If you love me, you will follow me. If you love me, you will put me first. 
Nehemiah was so convinced of this that he was able to take that open letter, this official document, and say there is no truth to any part of your story. You are making up the whole thing. What's he saying? I see you, enemy. You're making the whole thing up. There's no truth to it. There's no way that Nehemiah could do that if he wasn't walking closely with God. We have to be in close relationship with God to have faith. How do we expect more faith and more wisdom and more discernment if we don't spend time with him? We will get picked off by the enemy every single time if we aren't walking with God. God speaks to us in whispers, not a megaphone. Yeah, he's used a megaphone with me before, but typically he speaks to us in a still, small voice. Nehemiah says they were just trying to intimidate us, imagining that they could discourage us and stop the work. Who is trying to intimidate you from what God's called you to do? What if you stepped out in faith and you said to your spouse, you know what, I'm praying you come with me to church, but even if you don't, this is something I'm going to do. It's important to me. You know what? 30 years ago, I, was, I wronged you, but I'm no longer going to let you hold me spiritually hostage by what happened. I'm sorry it happened, and I've told you I'm sorry over and over and over. And if I could push a button and make it better, I could, but I can't. But I'm just telling you right now, I forgive you. I want you to forgive me, but I'm moving forward. I'm not going to be distracted by this anymore. And Nehemiah says, so I continued the work with an even greater determination. There's all kinds of ways that the enemy can distract us. It's only through our walk with God that we're able to discern those things. You'd think it's over now, but it's not. They even try more spiritual distractions. Scripture says, later I went to visit this other person who was confined to his home. And he said, let's meet together inside the temple of God and both the doors shut. Your enemies are coming to kill you tonight. What's he doing? Fear. Again, fear. You're not good enough. You'll never measure up. But I replied, should someone in my position run from danger? Should someone in my position enter the temple to save his life? No, I won't do it. I was so sure that God had spoken to to me about Columbus. I wasn't even remotely worried about how the board was going to handle that because I had heard from God. We have a great board, and they, they were on board. But if they weren't, I knew God was going to take care of that because I heard from God. And when you have heard from God, when he's spoken to you about something, it gives you faith. When you're not sure, fear can creep in. How do we, how do we get sure? We have to do the hard work of pressing in when we're, when we're tired. And, and we have to keep praying even when we don't hear anything. We have to fast when we would rather eat. We have to seek when we'd rather retreat. We have to allow God to do something in us instead of just pursuing everything that's around us. I realized that God had not spoken to him, but that he had uttered this prophecy against me because of these guys, and they had just hired him. They were hoping to intimidate me and make me sin. They would be able to accuse and discredit me. See, Satan has a strategy, church. We serve a God who's bigger, amen? We serve a God who's bigger, See, if Satan can destroy our faith in God's plan and replace it with fear, he's got us right where he wants us. We have a five-year plan. The first phase is to plant a church in Columbus, and we're excited at the Bicknell Center. We're going to be showing you an architect video of the new building that will be going up here in a couple years. We'll start raising funds for it. Sometimes when we 
think something's expensive or it seems like how could we do this or what could, you know, what, what's the, I don't see some way out of it. We can just get filled with fear or we can press in with faith, amen, and we can trust God and we can believe that he can do anything. It's not just about church. It's in your lives. It's easy to get motivated by fear. In fact, talking with different elderly people, my grandma's one of them. It's naturally, we get filled with fear as we get older. My son's going to start driving here in a year or two. Fills me with fear. Is he going to text when he drives? Is the person across the road going to text even if he's not? And we could just go down this road where we're constantly filled with fear and anxiety. But as we walk with God, he helps us manage healthy tension between fear and faith. See, sometimes healthy fear is okay. See, healthy fear motivates me to pray that Noah wouldn't text. And healthy fear motivates me to pray that the other person wouldn't text. But also, as I walk with God... He also says to me, you can't spend all your time worrying about what what ifs either, right? Spiritual distractions. Nehemiah knew what God had put in his heart and his faith was bigger than his fear. I shared with you before, I'm standing on the edge of a cliff as a youth sponsor at camp. I spent 49 minutes up there. What got me to jump off, you've heard the story, was one, it was time to leave. <laughs> Two, it was my only way down, but, but the one that really did it, because I thought about trying to climb down somehow without jumping, was the guy saying, if you're waiting for the feeling of fear to leave to jump, you're never going to jump. God doesn't promise when you walk with him that fear won't enter the picture. He promises to give you the strength to work through the fear. And despite the intimidations and the lies that that Satan tries to use with us and he tried to use with Nehemiah, Nehemiah writes, So on October 2nd, the city wall was finished just 52 days after it begun. Now, what we didn't realize in this story, sometimes we just hear the highlights. I go to a district assembly and pastors will give the highlights. You get on Facebook or Instagram and you just get the highlights. Everybody's, you know, their picture. I don't know what this does, but somehow that makes you skinny. And what we don't know, we went on vacation this summer, and what, what people didn't see in the pictures is the amount of time my wife got up at 4.30 in the morning to save the money so we could go. That's what wasn't on Facebook. When we read scripture where it says, so October 2nd, the wall was finished just 52 days after it begun, we don't necessarily, if we don't read the rest of the story, we don't see the, 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 the enemy's attacks, I want us to imagine for just a minute, in Columbus, online here, what's the city wall in your life that needs to be built and needs to be finished? There's no way I have enough time to try to describe all the different things it could be. But God wants to finish some things he started in you. And you keep waiting for everything to be perfect before you take faith out to dinner. Some of you have really nice cars in your garage that you only drive when the weather's nice. Faith faith isn't like that. You don't just take faith out when the the weather's clear. It's an all-weather thing. What if God, through you spending time with him, allowed you to stop being distracted by all the whys and the ifs and the what could go wrong, and you just let God work in you? Can you imagine? So on October 2nd, not literally, but figuratively, so that October 2nd could happen in your life. 
God's always kind of called me overseas, but you've never really said yes. Imagine October 2nd happening for you where you actually said yes and you actually started that process and you actually went. I've been kind of thinking for some time that God's been calling us to foster care, but I don't, and what would October 2nd look like? How would October 2nd start? Maybe you filling out an application, maybe you meeting with someone. You know, I just for a while, I felt like I needed to talk to some family. But, but, you know, every time I go over there, I'm distracted by their crankiness or Satan starts overwhelming me with the fact that they probably won't listen. What if you just had your mind on October 2nd instead of what you saw in the scene world? See, God's plans always include some type of action. And the enemy will always include some type of spiritual distraction. So, are you spiritually distracted or spiritually focused? Are you spiritually distracted by Satan's fear tactics or spiritually focused through faith in Jesus Christ? I don't know what you need to do with that today. Maybe this message is just for one person My hope would be that there would be a few that God would, as you walk with him, would begin to reveal to you what you need to focus on and what you need to say no to. What you need to stop being intimidated by and what you need to listen to. As we stand together in both locations, If you need to come and pray about this message or pray for someone else, you can do that today in either location. If you want to just talk with God right where you're at, you can do that. But if I was Satan right now, my strategy would be to get you to focus on what you got to do next after this service. I would, I would start to try to get you to focus on that this would wrap up so you could get out of here. I would draw your attention to the to-do list you've got to do before tomorrow. That's, if I was the enemy, that's what I would do. What if you pressed in? You ignored all of that and you let God speak to your heart today and you let him show you how you might be distracted. Let's worship this morning. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame but holy trust in Jesus name Christ alone cornerstone we may strong in the Savior's love seems to hide his face I rest on his unchanging grace in every high and stormy gale my anchor holds a bit of it my anchor i
what Kyle said um, you know Satan's always trying to destroy always in every way shape and form anything he can do to get our minds off of what God wants us to focus on he's going to do something and sometimes it's the little things that, that get you more than the big things and so I wonder today if there's something that God spoke to you about something that he like started to tug on your heart about maybe something that he was just like you know maybe it's time for this maybe it's time to, to step away from this or to start doing this or to start acting in this way towards your towards your parents or your family or your friends and starting start start acting this way at work start believing this way maybe it's something smaller or something bigger than that but what Kyle said I mean it, it, it wrecks me every time I hear it maybe God wants you to change and not just be challenged. It's okay to be challenged by something that's challenging. The more difficult thing is to be changed by it. God wants you to change. He wants you to be infinitely better than what your sinful, broken flesh has for you, which is death and destruction. He wants infinitely more for you than that. How can your life change in view of all the distractions, everything that, that Kyle laid on the table today? How can your life be changed by the power of the Holy Spirit? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your mercy that, that doesn't give us what we deserve and the grace that gives us what we could never deserve. God, thank you that your blood on the cross not only makes it so that it's like 
we've never sinned, but God, it's as if we've always obeyed. It's as if we've, we've never taken a step in the wrong direction. We ask you into our heart and things are just as if we, we've never sinned. We've never gone the wrong direction. Thank you for that truth, that reality today. Father, I pray that somebody's life could be changed, that they would turn from one way and go the opposite direction of where they were headed, that they would choose life, that they would choose peace, that they would choose love. God, I pray that that person in here who's been dealing with a physical ailment, that they would, that they would feel the warmth of your Holy Spirit, your presence. They might even be healed right now, God, as they're thinking about it. Father, I pray for the person who's struggling in their faith, who's afraid to step out because of what other people think, because of what other people are doing, because they say this way or they live this way, so I have to live in accord. God, I pray that that would get flung out the window. That they would forget about everything that their past had and that they would look forward to the future with you. That they would dive into your word, that they would fall in love with you. Pray for that person who's in having a hard time at home. Every little thing seems to take away their time. Every little thing seems to take that extra second that you thought, maybe, God, I could give this moment to you. God, I don't just pray that those distractions would become less, but I pray that that person would have the boldness to wake up a minute earlier, to stay up a minute later. God, because you're worth it. So, Father, as the ushers come forward, as we continue to worship you in giving, I pray that you would take what we give and multiply it times a billion. Take it and use it, and whenever we see people in our community, we would have compassion and believe that the church can actually do something about it because we are the church, God, and if we are willing to give And to do what you've called us to do, God, the whole world can be changed. Father, thank you so much. I pray that you would bless this offering. Bless these finances. Help us to do what you're calling us to do. And to no longer be distracted by what the enemy has for us. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen.